Well, I do want to say that uh, that song is uh, one of my favourites. And I remember George Beverly O'Shea singing that many, many times. And I pray that all our leaders of this nation would have that desire. We certainly need them to. They'd rather have Jesus than power and their pride. And uh, we need to pray for all of our rulers. Well, I want to thank you for the honour and uh, privilege of being here. You know, I originally come from Australia, as uh, uh, Dr. Sexton said, and I, I just want the congressman to know too that I, I didn't have an accent until I came to America. <laughs> and then for some funny reason, I suddenly had one. And I, I'm glad I do, because I don't want to speak like you. But you better get used to it. You're going to speak it in heaven anyway. So, and you can't prove I'm wrong just yet. You know, I first met Dr. Sexton a number of years ago. And the first time we met, I don't know, it was, it, to me it was an instant, instant kingship. Uh, because I think we have the same passion for the authority of the word of God. A passion for reaching coming generations with the truth of God's word and the gospel to equip them to be able to defend their faith and to be salt and light in this world. And a passion for doing things uh, with excellence. Because as Christians, we should, be, we should be better than the world. And we should, we should be because we have the most important message of all time. Well, I come from a ministry called Answers in Genesis, and we're an apologetics ministry and we're in the northern Kentucky area. Uh, we have, at peak time, uh, during the summer season, we have about a thousand staff, and uh, at other times, about uh, 700 full-time staff. We built the Creation Museum in 2006. It was uh, 2007, sorry, it was opened. And that goes back to my days in Australia and my burden in, as being a high school teacher. I was a science teacher in the high schools, and really burdened that the students were being taught evolution as fact. And all the museums only presented uh, evolution as fact. And so I had a real burden to build a creation museum. And the Lord answered that prayer. It goes back over 40 years, by the way, uh, when we opened the creation museum in 2007. Then 2016, we opened the Ark Encounter, a life-size ark right there in northern Kentucky. I encourage you to come and uh, see it. In fact, all my grandchildren just love the ark. We have 16 grandchildren, actually 17, because there's one in the womb right now. And so we actually have 17. That's my pro-life statement for the night, right? And uh, there we are with uh, the 16 uh, that we have there right now. So I want to show you just a short video of the Creation Museum and the ark to see what God has done uh, in just three hours north of here, actually, and encourage you to come and visit. And then I want to take one of the exhibits that we have. We, we have an exhibit in the Ark. We have an exhibit in the Creation Museum. We have many, many exhibits, but uh, one specific to an issue that I think we hear every day on the media. Racism. Races. Black people. White people. And, and I want to deal with that because one of the things that I found is even though we have some stunning exhibits dealing with this at the Ark and the Creation Museum, we've had media from all over the world we have media there almost every week, and the, all the secular media in America have been there, and I haven't been able to get one of them to actually report on what we have there in regard to these exhibits, because I don't think they really want people to have the answers, and I don't think they want them to have the answers to racism, and they don't want to admit the Bible has the answer to racism. But anyway, let me show you a little video here. This is sort of a fast-paced video just to give you a glimpse. <laughs> The Creation Museum is actually a walk through history. It's a walk through the Bible. We begin at creation and we take you all the way through to consummation. It's sort of like a walk from Genesis to Revelation, but we're answering skeptical questions and we show how science confirms the Bible. 
and we're equipping people to be able to defend the Christian faith. We're challenging non-Christians that the Bible's history is true. That's why the gospel based on that history is true. We also have a planetarium. We have a very high-tech 4D theatre with special interactive infrared glasses that we just opened and uh, petting zoo and gardens. And then the Ark Encounter, uh, which was opened uh, just over two years ago. You can walk through the entire Ark, three floors of exhibits. It's the biggest timber frame structure in the world. And it sits on 800 acres. And we also have one of the biggest restaurants in America, 1500 seat restaurant, it has incredible food. And we're opening a 2500 seat multi-purpose center. April and we have a zoo and we're expanding the zoo right now and we have all sorts of other interesting items outside as well. So how many of you want to come now to the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum? There we are. You can think about uh, the summer coming up. Actually we're really looking forward to summer coming up right now but some really low temperatures are going to get very low next week too. But I encourage you to come. Well we're going to deal with this topic of races. If somebody said to you, how many races there are in the world, what would you say? Say there's a number of races, uh, many races. Actually, I would tell you there's only one race when it comes to human beings. There's only one race of people. You know, Darwin actually taught there were different races. Because Darwin taught that people evolved from ape-like creatures and some are closer to the apes than others. Did you know that Darwinian evolution inherently is a racist philosophy? It is, I'll show you a quote from Darwin a little later on, show you it's inherently a racist philosophy. By the way, have you ever heard uh, from the secular media or others saying we should ban Darwin from the schools because it's racist? No, they won't say that, and yet it is. But you know, most people have never read Darwin. They've never read The Origin of Species. Most people have never read The Descent of Man. For instance, how many in this room have actually read his second major book? He wrote a number of books, but the one written 12 years after The Origin of Species, The Descent of Man. How many of you have actually read The Descent of Man? You know, I see a few hands, maybe five, six, seven hands in a room of 2,500 people. Most teachers have never read Darwin on The Descent of Man. Most university professors haven't. But Darwin actually promoted a racist uh, ideology. Now, when you start with the Bible, the Bible gives us a very different history that God created, that sin and death entered the world, so then there was corruption. There was a flood called the Tower of, a flood called Noah's Flood, and that's where we believe most of your fossil record came from. And then there was an event called the Tower of Babel, and God gave different languages, and as a result, we formed different people groups, not different races. And God's Son stepped into history to be Jesus Christ, the God-man, to be our relative, to be of the one human race, to be a descendant of Adam, called the last Adam, to die for the descendants of Adam because of our sin in Adam, but to be raised from the dead and offers a free gift of salvation. That's the history as God gives us. The history that's foundational to understanding what life is all about, what our problem is, sin, what the solution is, in Jesus Christ. And there are these major events in history at the Ark and the Creation Museum. We go through all these major events in different sorts of ways and challenge people's thinking and give them answers. But we deal with this particular topic of the Tower of Babel. And what we're doing is this. It's, it's what this college here is all about. And that is that we have a foundation for our thinking from the one who knows everything and has always been there that gives us the key information to have the right worldview to enable us how to correctly understand this world. And I want to deal with that in regard to this issue. So how do we answer people when they say, where do all the races come from? Or how come there are black people and white people? And to start with, we have to do a little basic course in genetics. Sorry about that. But you're going to be in a science class here tonight. We're going to do a little basic course in genetics. And as we do that, I'm just going to give you the big picture perspective. We have a, a, a scientist at Answers in Genesis who has a PhD in molecular genetics. And by the way, she uses the same slides I do because there are some basic principles and big picture perspectives that all of us can understand. You don't have to be a PhD in genetics to understand it. And we're going to start actually with a Bible verse. In Genesis 1:24, the Bible tells us that God created 
the living creature after its kind, and then he created the creeping things and so on, after his kind. In fact, we read that phrase, after his kind, after their kind, uh, about 10 times in Genesis chapter 1. The implication here is that each kind will reproduce its own kind. In other words, you'd expect dogs to produce dogs. You'd expect elephants to produce... See, it is easy. You're catching on. Let me try one more. Cats to produce... You got it. And of course you say, well, of course we know that. Well, yes, we do. And that's the point. And then we encounter that word kind. The word kind is the English word translated from a Hebrew word. We encounter it again in Genesis chapter 6 when it says, God sent two of every kind, seven pairs of some, but two of every kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal to go on Noah's Ark. When I debated Bill Nye, Bill Nye the science guy, or I would call him Bill Nye the humanist guy, a few years ago, at the Creation Museum, he mocked at me for believing in Noah's Ark. There's no way you can believe in Noah's Ark. You couldn't get all those animals on board. There'd be millions of species needed to be on board the Ark. Really? That's not true. There's plenty of room on Noah's Ark. You see, let's look at that word kind. It comes from the Hebrew word uh, mean. So the word kind, how do we understand that? Well, today we have an arbitrary classification system that man has invented, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And what we would say in the majority of instances, not all, but the majority of instances, the word kind would correspond mostly to the family level of classification. Usually not genus and species, mainly family. Sometimes order, but mainly family. And how do we come to that understanding? Well, I'm going to show you about dogs here tonight, and we're going to talk about a specific dog as well. Well, it's, it's a lesser dog, it's a poodle, but we'll talk about that in a moment. But you see, our researchers for many, many years leading up to building the ark exhibits looked at all the different land animals, living, and those in the fossil record, they're extinct and so on, and those that are living is very easy because they look for documentation of which could breed with which. And so with dogs, there are dingoes, wolves, coyotes, uh, foxes, bennets, your domestic varieties of dogs and so on. And they're able to show, oh, this one bred with that one, but that one bred with that one. That one never bred with this one, but it did breed with that one, that bred with that one, that bred with this one over here. And then they can show that they're all interconnected, so they're all the one kind. And when they went through and did all that research, they came to the conclusion that at the most, and this is just one of the smaller exhibits there at the Ark Encounter, at the most, we would say there are 1,400 kinds that were needed on Noah's Ark. By the way, that's way overestimated. I'll tell you why. For instance, if, uh, if you take bats, we believe all bats are probably the one kind, but there's many different species, but they've never documented them into breeding, so we allow them to be separate kinds, but we suspect they're all the one kind. When it comes to the fossil record, we see skeletons of animals that we suspect belong to the one kind, but you can't see fossils breed. You, you might guess why that is. Uh, they're dead. Uh, so we can't see them breed. And uh, so we allow there to be different kinds. We think, in actual fact, there's probably less than a thousand kinds. See, when it comes to dogs, all dogs are one kind. Now, this is where people have some problems because they say, but wait a minute, look at all those changes. How could you get all those different dogs if they're all the one kind? In fact, when you see ev evidence in the, in the public school textbooks for speciation, they say speciation is evidence of evolution. In fact, in the newspapers, often you'll read someone talking about evidence for evolution and 90% of the time their evidence will be speciation. But speciation is not evolution. And I want to show you that. See, when it comes to dogs, there's one dog family, the dog family Canidae, and we would say there's one dog kind, different genera, different species, but you only needed two of the dog family on the ark. That's all you needed. The same when it comes to cats. There's one cat family, Philidae, and all you needed were two cats on the ark. You didn't need two lions and two tigers and so on. You just needed two of the cat kind. Now, how do we understand this? How could you get all those different species then within a kind? 
Well, in the secular world, we're going to talk about dogs because there's a lot of work being done on dogs. They say that the dog family is a diverse group of about 34 species. And they say this, based on the genetic, morphological and behavioural data, it's clear that the domestic dog originates from the wolf. Now think about that for a moment. Here's a wolf and they're saying something like wolves gave rise to your domestic varieties you have today, including, including these. Of course, people would say, now that looks like a dog. That, I'm not so sure that that looks like a dog. And actually, I want you to understand what's happening here, because we're going to talk about genetics, as I said. And as you understand genetics of the dog kind, you start to realise that there's all this information in the genes, and over time, you can get less and less information in the genes until you get to the stage where there's just not much information left. In fact, I would say that something like the poodle is right at the end of the line in dogs. If it lost any more information, <laughs> that'd be it. It'd be gone. There'd be no dogs. Now, people, people often ask me, why do you pick on poodles? Because one bit me once. And so I don't hold a grudge, but I'm going to give you the truth about poodles. Now, we don't know how many dogs God made originally. Let's say he made two dogs, and they got married, had kids, and they got married, had kids, and they got married, had kids, and we end up with lots of dogs, okay? Sort of like typical homeschool families today. Now, okay, so, so people say to me, <laughs> I'm going to get in the trouble here, aren't I? <laughs> so people say to me, okay, but how do you get all those different species? Okay, well, in genetics, we have a convention where we label genes with letters, capital letters, small letters. Remember talking, when you went to school, you learn about dominant genes and recessive genes, remember that? Now, it's much more complex, much more technical, but this is the big picture to help us understand. So, big A, big B, big C represent uh, dominant genes, and, and, and there are thousands and thousands more of these, and there's millions of combinations, zillions of combinations, in fact. But this gives you the idea. If that's a male and female dog, and they have big A, little a, big B, little b, big C, little c, then uh, the po possible information that we have there arises uh, from those genes that are there and all the possible combinations. And from those particular genes, you can get these combinations. Big A, big B, uh, big Cs, uh, little a's, little b's, little c's, and so on. Now, I want to use the second one there, the little a's, little b's, little c's, as uh, purebred dogs like poodles, right? Because I want us to understand something here. I want you to have a look at that. If little a, little a, little b, little b, little c, little c is a poodle, could you breed poodles together to get back to the original dogs? And the answer is no, because you don't have all the information. You see what I mean? It's lost variability. It's lost the big A's, the big B's, the big C's. It's still a dog, right? It's got all the combination to be a dog. Think about yourselves. You come from your mother and your father. One set of information from the mother, one set of information from the father. You are a different combination to your mother and your father. A unique combination. Now, by the way, can I do a little side here, seeing as we've seen this in the news lately? Right at fertilization, you are a unique combination of information. It's not part of the mother's body. It comes from the mother and the father. No new information is ever added. And in fact, the body looks on it as a foreign object to reject, but God has put an anti-rejection mechanism in the womb that welcomes it. Which means abortion is killing a human being. It is murder. But anyway, let's go on here. And the Bible tells us humans are made in the image of God. No animals are. So at the point of fertilization, a unique combination of information, a unique individual made in the image of God. But see, understanding genetics helps us here. And so if you breed two poodles together, you, you, you can't get back to the original dog kind. But if, but if you started with the original dog kind, could you again get poodles? The answer is yes, because you got all the information. Not that you'd want to, but, but yes, okay? Now, I want you to understand something else. Do you, know, do you know how much information we have in our genes? Do you know what it means? Has anyone here counted the number of atoms in the universe? You know how small an atom is? 
They estimate the number of atoms in the universe was 10 to the 80th power. That's a lot of atoms. If you took one man and one woman from this audience, actually, isn't, there are women here somewhere, I think, yes. <laughs> but if you took one man and one woman from any audience, okay, how many children could you have potentially without having two with the same combination of information? Keep in mind that that's a number of atoms in the universe. This is the number of potential children one man and one woman could have without having two with the same combination of information. That number, 10 to the 2017th power, is so great you can't even understand it at all. It's massive. I want you to understand something. God put that sort of variability in the kinds that he made. The dog kind, the cat kind, the elephant kind. You get the idea? Two of each kind with an incredible amount of variability in their genes go on Noah's Ark. We didn't need near the number of animals that people think. And then they come off the Ark and they begin to increase in numbers. But as they increase in numbers, they're not going to stay together. Over time, they will split up from each other and move away from each other. And what will happen is you'll get different combinations. Some survive better in some areas than others. And you'll end up with separate groups that have unique sort of combinations and different combinations to other groups from the original amount of massive variability that God put there. Just a little aside. When you look at all the information in the DNA of living things on this planet, it is so massive. It, it, they would just stand in awe of it. Do you realize, if you don't believe in God, the people who say there's no God, the atheists that are having such an impact on our culture, they have to believe that matter gave rise by itself to that information. Not only that, the information in our DNA is read by a language. You could open up my Bible, if it happened to be in Russian and I didn't have the Russian language, I couldn't read it. I've got to have the right language to read, to understand the information. DNA actually has a language. In fact, DNA has the information to make the language to read the DNA. And it's all got to be there or it won't work. We know in science, no one has ever, ever seen, and never will, where matter can generate a code by itself. Matter has never generated one piece of information by itself. And yet, this earth is filled with zillions of bits of information. You see, God created all these pools of information to start with. And then, with the land animals, two of each of a particular pool of information, two of the dog kind, for instance, got on Noah's Ark. They come off Noah's Ark. They start to increase in number, split up, go to different places, and form different species. Let me help explain that to you. Here are the two dogs that got off Noah's Ark. They fell in love. Had to. There's only two. So, And we're going to look at these two genes, S for short hair, L for long hair. S and L together give a medium hair length in dogs. And so they have an offspring that gets two S's. It's got short hair. Here, here's how the public school students are often indoctrinated and brainwashed. Students, when you see something new, that's what evolution does. It produces something new. Oh, look, this is new. A new species with short hair. That's new. That's evolution. Actually, if you look inside, not just on the outside, but look on the inside, you know what is new? The combination of information that was already there. It's not new information. Actually, it's got less information than the parents because it no longer has the L gene. And so, yes, it's got something new, but you've got to understand the inside. And then you get one that has the same combination, and then, oh, look at this one, long hair, there's something new. Oh, look, evolution. Actually, what's new? The combination of information. It's got less information. That's the opposite of evolution. Less information? No, no, no. For evolution, you've got to have more information and brand new information that never existed to create a characteristic that never was before possible, so somehow matter has to produce new information. You don't observe that. You, you observe loss of information. The information was all there to start with. God's word is true. And so then over time, as they move away from each other, what happens? Well, imagine they go towards a cold climate. 
In a cold climate, those with short hair and medium hair get cold. And they die. <laughs> and now you're only left with those with L genes who only produce dogs with L genes. Now you've got a specific species. Oh, look what evolution's done. It's got this brand new species and they can only produce long-haired dogs. That's because they lost the information they once had. Or what about those that go towards a hot climate? In a hot climate, those with long hair and those with medium hair overheat. And then they die. And now you're only left with dogs with S genes who on their own only produce dogs with S genes. So what's new? You see, what's happening there is called natural selection. You've heard of natural selection, speciation, adaptation. That's what I was really picturing for you. And they're taught in the public schools that natural selection, speciation, and adaptation is part of the major mechanisms for evolution. Actually, what is happening with natural selection, there's no brand new information ever formed. It's the opposite of ev evolution. Natural selection results in loss of information, not increasing information. That's why I said to you, when you look at our purebred dogs, see, how do people get the purebred dogs like poodles? Well, here's what they do. It's done by artificial selection. So we determine which combinations survive. It's not what environment they survive in better. It's, oh, look, here's a dog with a short nose and another dog with a short nose. Let's breed them together and uh, let's get rid of all the long nose genes so we've only got short nose genes. You get the idea? And we've got an additional problem. You see, we live in a fallen world and so sin has affected the world. And so because of Adam's sin, now, everyone dies. <laughs> There's an encouraging message for you. Everyone in this room is going to die because death is a penalty for sin. And we have diseases because of those mutations. It's not God's fault. That's what the, the secularists always do today. That's a whole other talk in itself that we could talk about, the issue of death and suffering. It's not God's fault there's death and suffering in the world. It's our fault because we sinned against a holy God. He stepped into history to save us from what we did. And so... Because of sin now, there are mistakes that are copied from one generation to the next and new mistakes, copying mistakes. And over time, those mutations have increased. In fact, we carry a big genetic load as humans, lots of mistakes. I just look around the room and see them all uh, staring at me. You see, we've all, we've all got those mistakes. And so what happens is, if you take poodles, you know, if you have one of those purebred dogs, like a chihuahua or a poodle, uh, one of those sorts of dogs, you'll know that you keep vets in business because you have to pay millions of dollars to keep them alive. And you know they'll say, oh, this breed here, it has eye problems. This one has arthritis problems. Oh, the bulldog, actually the bulldog has mutations that stuffed its jaw up into its face and its nose up into its head. And we look at it and say, isn't it beautiful? And the poor thing can hardly breathe, <laughs> right? You see, really... When you look at something like a poodle, the best way to describe a poodle, the correct definition of a poodle would be, it is a sin-cursed, degenerate, mutated copy of the original. <laughs> right? So that's what you say to your wife. I'm going to take my sin-cursed, degenerate, mutated copy of the original dog to the vet uh, because it's got a problem. All right. Now, <laughs> by the way, I'm always trying to teach people from a biblical worldview perspective. I had a lady once who came up to me elderly lady and she said to me but is my poodle going to be in heaven with me and you know I try to be nice and gentle but I got to be honest and I said ma'am there's no sin in heaven <laughs> now I'm really in trouble aren't I now some of you might say but God made the poodle wait a minute when God made everything he said it was very good you can't look at a poodle and say it is very good <laughs> right it's a degenerate mutant See, God made the original dog of which the poodle and all the other dogs we have today are descendants. You know that's important? Because you know what happens? What happens is this. We say to our children, oh, God made the poodle. I've actually seen books where it says God made the poodle. And then they go to schools where they're taught, your parents taught you God created all these animals? No. In fact, you know what some of the children's books, a lot of the children's books actually tell children, God created all the animals and plants we see today. You know, here's a problem with saying it like that. God created all the original kinds of animals of which the ones today are descendants, but here's what happens. 
in our public school system and the majority of our kids from church homes go to the public schools, here's what you'll hear teachers say, your parents were wrong because we've seen new species form so evolution's true, God didn't create them as they are. We know these domestic dogs, they came about in the last few hundred years. That's why it's so important to teach them correctly that God made the original kinds and the ones today are descendants of those that got on Noah's Ark back to the ones that God made. And so over time, what happens as these dogs move away from each other, they, you form different species. But it's not evolution. To help us understand further, Here's a jar of jelly beans representing the amount of variability and information in, say, the original dog. Over time, you get less and less information till you get to the stage where there's just not a great deal of information left. Oh, and by the way, I hate cats. If I'd have been on Noah's Ark, I don't think there'd be any cats. They would have been overboard. Hey, by the way, look, let me show you something here that's interesting. There are 338 breeds of dogs that have been formed in the last several hundred years through artificial selection. So let me ask you a question. What can natural processes do in a few thousand years in the wild acting on created genetic diversity? And, and the reason I'm asking this is because when the evolutionists look at different species out there in the wild, they say, that's taken hundreds of thousands of years and so on, and over millions of years, that's how we get all the different animals that, that we have and, and that sort of thing. But here's what I want to say. Much can happen in a short period of time because the genetic diversity already exists to help the organism adapt. See, evolutionists believe that the genetic diversity has to be formed to enable it to adapt. We're saying no, it was already in existence, which is why adaptation, natural selection, speciation can and has happened very quickly. And let me show you a real example here. Look on the left. The Great Dane and Yorkshire Terrier are the same species, our domestic species of dogs, yet they look very, very different, as you can see. But look on the right. The wolf, lupus, and coyote look very similar yet they are classed as different species. And the evolutionists tell us those species on the right took a long time to form, but we know the ones on the left that have far greater differences were formed very quickly. And the point I want to make to us is this. Think about how much genetic diversity must have already been present in dogs if artificial selection can accomplish those differences in just a few hundred years so to form all those different species of dogs after the flood does not take long at all. In fact, speciation happens quickly. There are species forming right now while we're sitting here. It doesn't take millions of years. And so on the left there, you see the tree of evolution. Evolutionists believe all life is related, that we're all related to everything. We're related to all the animals. We're related to the plants. We're related to everything. There's one tree of life. But the Christians and creationists based on the Bible would say there's many different trees and each tree has lots of branches. There's a dog tree that has a lot of branches. There's a cat tree that has a lot of branches. Actually, the science of con genetics conforms, or confirms the orchard on the right there, not the one tree on the left, because the orchard on the right, based on the Bible, confirmed by science, is the true history of the animal kinds. Isn't that exciting to be a Christian? Wow, 15 people excited, that's good. <laughs> and so again, it helps us answer the question, how did Noah get all the animals on the ark? He didn't need anywhere near the number of animals. Now, I started off saying, I want to talk about the issue of races and racism and, and black people and white people and so on. What has this got to do with that? Well, when you have a basic understanding of genetics, this will really help us, because we'll apply that now to genetics in the human kind. If the Bible's history is true, we're all descendants of one man and one woman. Yet, when we look around the world, we see distinct people groups. We see Australian Aborigines and American Indians and, and Eskimos, and so it goes on. And we, we can say oh, that's a particular uh, group of people that have distinguishing characteristics. How could that happen? Well, for that to happen, if you think about the dogs, you'd have to split up the population of humans 
and take groups away from each other and isolate them from each other for those distinctive characteristics uh, to really come about. So can anyone think, is there anything in the Bible that could explain how you could split up the population of people and isolate groups from each other? Can anyone think of any event in history? The Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, where God gave different languages, Genesis 10, the Table of Nations, and talks about people moving away from each other, and you'd be isolated groups, and you'd end up with distinguishing characteristics and developing different cultures. People, that's exactly what's happened. By the way, that's why you have flood legends in cultures all over the world, because there was a real flood handed down through the time of, of Noah as an account, and then over time, as it's been handed down, it's changed. The real record is in the Bible, but the elements are so similar to what's in the Bible. It's exciting, because all we observe around the world totally confirms the Bible's history. You know, when Darwin wrote his book, The Origin of Species, and then... Twelve years later, he wrote The Descent of Man. It actually engendered a per particular type of racism. It actually fueled racism. In fact, the late Stephen Jay Gould, ardent evolutionist from Harvard University, said this, biological arguments for racism may have been common in the 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. And you see, when you read Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, which most evolutionists have never read, here's just one quote. At some future period, the civilized races of man will almost ex certainly exterminate and replace the savage races. He is talking about civilized and savage and so on. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider. And he says, then the Caucasian and some ape as low as a baboon instead of now between the Negro, Australian, Aborigine and the gorilla. Direct from Darwin's descent of man. In other words, the Australian Aborigine and certain people from Africa are closer to the apes than others. You know, I remember learning about this at school in Australia, about how Darwin's views affected people's attitudes to the Australian Aborigines. In 1924, there was a newspaper published in New York called the New York Tribune, and when it said that the missing links were found in Australia, the Australian Aborigines. Do you know what's not well known, and, and, and in fact, the, the, the secular world doesn't want it to be known. In America, in the public schools in the 1900s, in fact, at the very time of the Scopes trial, in fact, John Scopes supposedly taught from this book, although he wasn't a science teacher anyway, uh, all you read about the Scopes trial, most of what you read is just simply not true. It's inaccurate, it's misrepresentation. Uh, the media misrepresents it all the time. Oh, that's a surprise. Uh, but in... One of the main biology textbooks used in the public schools in America in 1925, a book by Hunter, we actually read this. This is what students were taught in their biology classes, their science classes. The races of man, at present time there exist upon the earth five races, the highest type of all, the Caucasians, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. That was based on Darwinian evolution. Because Darwinian evolution inherently is a racist philosophy. You know, it's interesting that um, just recently, one of the co-discoverers for DNA, you might have re read about it, Watson, he's in his 90s, but uh, they took away from him all the honours they'd given to him in the past, and he, he was barred from this particular laboratory where he had an honorary position because he made some statements that were racist, and they were racist. He made the same statements many, many years ago because he believed in evolution. But will the same people ban Darwin from schools because Darwinian evolution is inherently racist? Oh, no, they don't want anyone to know about it. Most people have never read Darwin anyway. They wouldn't know what he says. It's just however he's been represented by the media and those trying to brainwash us. I'm going to challenge us tonight. I'm going to challenge us that we need to stop using the term racist. We need to throw the term racist in the trash can, so to speak. Because if the Bible's true, there's only one race. We all go back to Adam and Eve, and the Bible's history is true. See, when I went to school, I was taught, oh, there's all these different racial groups, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, Australoid. Hand up those of you who were taught that sort of distinction. Yeah, I was taught that. Did you ever ask your teachers this? On what basis did they decide there were different races? What basis did they use? Because, you see, we've now found out with the study of genetics... They had no basis to divide groups into racial groups like that. 
In the year 2000, it was announced to the world, it was headlines in newspapers, headlines in the New York Times, for instance, that the Human Genome Project, and this particular project was headed by an atheist, Dr. Venter, but they did good observational science, study of human genetics from genes all around the world, from humans. And they put together, and this was in the newspapers, they put together a draft of the entire sequence of the human genome, and the researchers unanimously declared, there is only one race, the human race. Wow. Who would have ever thought of that idea? What a radical concept. There's only one race. Wow. And in fact, secular scientists are saying this over and over again, but it's interesting. I noticed the secular media isn't saying it, and I would say that the Al Sharptons and Jesse Jacksons of this world don't want to say it because I think they want to fuel racism. You see, in the journal Counseling Development, Secular Journal 1998, evidence continues to collect that the term race is meaningless used to point out differences in people that are not definitive. Now in 2004, in Nature Genetics, an evolutionist secular journal, humans vary only slightly at the DNA level and that only a small proportion of this variation separates continental populations or people groups. And this one from the American biology teacher, 2011, here is the biological problem with race. The genetic variation within each of the various ethnic groups of Homo sapiens is greater than that between the various ethnic groups. What is that saying? They're now finding that those so-called different races, that the genetic differences between, between or, or in each group, that the genetic difference within each group that was once called a separate race, that difference is far greater than the differences between the groups. Which means the whole concept of races in humans is meaningless. It's non-existent. In fact, and this is another uh, quote here from a secular uh, source, but the genes that explain the phenotypic differences, characteristics like hair color, skin shade, etc., between populations only represent a tiny part of our genome, confirming once again the concept of race from a genetic standpoint has been abolished. And that was quoting someone from the National Science, uh, Center for Scientific Research. Do you realize that, what that means? Even when you look around this room, as I quickly look around, I see differences in skin shade, I see differences in eye shapes, I see differences in nose shapes, ear shapes, do you realize that all those differences, all of them, represent a tiny part of our genome? And yet we take particular ones and we may make them major. All because of usually prejudice. The American biology teacher, 2011, all humans are one race, homo sapiens. There is absolutely no genetic or evolutionary justification for racial categories of humans. And then in, in the New York Times, in regard to the Human Genome Project, very interesting comment. And this was by the Professor of Molecular Genetics at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta. The criteria that people use for race are based entirely on external features we are programmed to recognize. And people, I want to suggest to us that in America, in different, in different cultures around the world, they're programmed in different ways. We've been programmed in this culture to look at skin color in a particular way, particularly black and white. Isn't that true? And in fact, I want to suggest to you, if you weren't programmed that way from, from, from when we were young, we wouldn't see the differences as major as we do because the differences are only minor. In fact, I want to ask us a question. Are there really different colors of skin in humans? Is there really black and is there really white? In fact, I want to say to you this. There's no true, really, really, truly black people and there's no truly white people. In fact, I am not a white person. And I'm going to, you want me to prove it to you? I can, do you realize I can prove it to you using observational science right now that I'm not a white person? That's true. That is white. If I look like that, you'd be calling 911. <laughs> what is your problem, sir? We have a white person talking to us. Please come quickly. <laughs> Actually, do you realize it's not different colors? 
It's actually different shades. We all have the same basic color. The main color pigment we have is a pigment called melanin, and it's a brown pigment. You realize we're all brown. Now, you can go to the paint shop, and you can say, okay, I want to paint my house brown. Give me all the shades. You know those uh, uh, little cards they have, and they fold them out. Uh, okay, show me the darkest brown, show me the lightest brown, all the way in between. That's really what it is with human skin color. There's a few other pigments and things, but this is the main pigment. Now, there's a lot more genes involved, and it's a lot more complex than this, but let's for argument say we got four genes, big A, little a, big A, big B mean a lot of melanin, little a, little B mean a little bit of melanin. So, if you had all big A's and big B's, you'd have dark skin. If you had all little A's and little B's, you'd have light skin. And if you were a mixture, you'd be in the middle, middle brown. By the way, the majority of the world's population are actually middle brown. They're in the mixture, because you, you take the bell curve. Dark over here, middle brown here, real light skin over here. That, that's basically how it graphs out. And let me explain this to you, because in the outer layer of our skin, uh, the epidermis, we have it there, and you see uh, a s sections through the skin there. And if you look up the top, you will take that outer layer of skin there, uh, and you have special cells in there called melanocytes. And they sort of look like an upside-down umbrella. And they have these tentacles. And melanocytes have little organelles in them called melanosomes that actually produce packets of pigment called melanin. And then that pigment sort of migrates to the surface of the skin. And so if you have genes for a lot of melanin, you'll find it produces a lot of those packages that migrate to the skin. You have very dark skin. If you have genes that say not much melanin, well, you won't have as, as much that is there, uh, and so you won't be uh, near as dark. Actually, when you tan in the sun, that stimulates the production of melanin, but only to a certain maximum, depending on what genes you have. And that's why you'll only tan to a certain shade, and then that's it, because that's all your genes uh, will allow. It's a very complex process, but it really helps us to under, understand this. And melanin is important. It's important for a number of reasons, because we need, our skin needs to be protected from ultraviolet rays, and there's production of vitamin D in our skin, and all sorts of other things as well. So it's all very important. Now, question for you. What shade was Adam and Eve's skin? Not what colour. See, I'm going to challenge us tonight that we need to start changing our terminology. If you really want to reach people, we've got to start changing our terminology. I want to suggest to you that we should be using shade, not colour. What shade is a person, not what colour they are. That we don't talk about races, but we talk about people groups. People belong to different people groups. That everyone's a coloured person. In fact, sometimes we hear, oh, there's a group of people of colour. I've got news for you. This whole group is a people of colour. You are all coloured people. If you're not, you have a problem, you need to go see a doctor. Everyone's related to everyone else. I remember once, I was walking down the street, and this is when my beard was a little darker, and my hair was darker, and someone said to me, you know you look like Abraham Lincoln? I said, yeah, he's one of my relatives. You're related to Abraham Lincoln? I said, yeah, it actually goes back to Noah, back to Adam, you know, use it as a point of presenting the gospel, you know what I mean? See, I'm even related to Dr. Sexton. That's why we had such a kinship. When we met, it was like a family reunion. It's true. We're all related to it. Think about that with someone you don't like. I'm related to them. They're my family. You know, when I went to Sunday school, I was taught this little chorus. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Anyone here remember learning that, that song? Yeah. Do you realize it teaches incorrect information and, and actually lays a basis for discrimination? Because actually, the correct wording, instead of red and yellow, black and white, should be this. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, shades of brown from dark to light, all are precious in his sight. Can you imagine if we taught generations like that? Shades of brown from dark to light. By the way, there are some other implications of all this, too. For instance, I was at a church speaking, and uh, a man came up, on stage, and he was very dark skin. People would say, he's a black person. I'd say, no, he wasn't. He's the same color as I am. He just had more, sh more of the color than I do. He came up to me and he said, so we're all one color? 
said, yep. Just different shade? Yep. Ah, uh, so there's no black people or white people? I said, that's correct. Wow. He said, I voted for President Obama because he was black. Now you're telling me that was a stupid reason to vote for someone. <laughs> yeah, that is a stupid reason to vote for someone. That's true. And, you know, I, I use that as an example for that particular congregation. And I said, actually, you know, as Christians, we shouldn't be voting for someone because they're Republican or Democrat or black, so-called, or white, so-called, or independent. You know what we need to do? To judge what they believe and teach against the absolute authority of the word of God and then do our best to vote in accord with that. There was another church I was at and there was a man with his wife sitting with the pastor. And I remember it distinctly, it was over on my left. And the man had very dark skin, the wife had very light skin. You know what people would call that? An interracial marriage. Wait a minute, how can you have an interracial marriage when we're all one race? That's stupid. And I remember the pastor telling me, he said it was hilarious, he said the dark skinned man turned to me and said, I'm just pleased to know I'm not married to a white woman. <laughs> Do you know what else that means? Hey, I, t I tell you a way we can be a witness. When you go into the doctor's office or dentist or whatever it is and they give you all those stupid forms to fill out, it says, what race are you? You just write down, Adams. <laughs> and when the girl at the front desk says to you, what's this Adams race? Adam, don't you know Adam was the first man? Do you know we're descendants of Adam? Do you know we're all related to each other? Do you know that Adam sinned and death came into the world? That's why there's death in the world. That's why we're going to die. Do you know you're going to die? You're going to die. And that's because of sin, because you're a sinner. You know what God did? He stepped into history in the person of Jesus Christ to be the God-man, to die on the cross and be raised from the dead and offers a free gift of salvation. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Get on your knees. Repent. They are. You can give the gospel in 30 seconds, right? But think about the witness we could be if we started writing down things the correct way instead of just conforming to where the culture is at. So what shade was Adam and Eve's skin? Well, if Adam and Eve had all little A's and little B's, the whole world would be like that. If Adam and Eve had all big A's and big B's, the whole world would be dark. But that does not fit with what we see in our culture because we see incredible genetic variability. It makes more sense. Adam and Eve were middle brown, probably with a mixture of genes, the biggest potential that God gave to, in regard to skin color right there in Adam and Eve. So their children in one generation could have been dark through light. If you think that's radical, there are many places in America where you see parents that are, that are middle brown that will have children darker than them and children lighter than them. In fact, there are many instances in the world where there are twins, dark and light twins. And you'll see a lot of these in countries where there are middle brown people. It's very, very easy to understand. And then because of the Tower of Babel, as people moved away from each other, if you had a culture where wh whoever married who and others left and others died and you only end up with those with big A's and big B's on their own, they're only going to produce dark-skinned people. If you ended up with a culture that had... Uh, ended up with those that only had little A's and little B's on their own, they only produced light-skinned people. You know, eye shape is the same. The, one of the major factors in eye shape is the amount of fat in your eyelid. It's just a genetic variation. It's just a tiny variation, and you can have that arm and shape. And so I like what the ABC News said in 1998, quoting uh, a scientist, what the facts show is there are differences among us, but they stem from culture, not race. The major differences we have are cultural differences. You see, what I'm saying to you is when you start from the Bible and you understand some really good science, observational science, the science of genetics, it actually confirms the Bible's history. And I want to sort of round all this off by referring back to a topic that I mentioned earlier. See, I say that so you think I'm getting near the end. Dr. Sexton thinks, oh, it's getting near the end. Interracial marriage, I said there's no such thing. According to God's word, there's one biological race. But you know what? According to God's word, there are two spiritual races. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, what communion have light with darkness. You see, which impending marriage here does God's word clearly counsel against? Does God's word clearly counsel against A? 
or counsel against B or counsel against C? Which one? C. Biological fact, all humans belong to one race. Spiritual fact, all humans are divided into two races. What is the difference between the two spiritual races? The direction in which they are racing. The world is the broad way and it's all going this direction. Christians live in the narrow way and by the way, it's hard to go in the opposite direction. Really hard. Which is why I praise the Lord for colleges like this that are training generations to be able to go in that opposite direction and be a witness to the world. You see, the interracial marriage that God's word speaks against is a marriage between the spiritual races. You know, an example, in the Bible, the, the Israelites were told not to marry the Canaanites. And yet, when you look at Rahab, who was in the city of Jericho, a Canaanite, presumably a descendant of Ham, it seems she's the same Rahab in the lineage leading to Jesus. How could that be? They were told not to marry Canaanites. Yeah, you know why? Because they were pagans. When she stopped being a Canaanite spiritually and became an Israelite spiritually, believing in the one true God, then she was free to marry an Israelite believing in the one true God. And you know, that's, that's the challenge that I have for people. We have got to stop looking on the outside at minor differences. We're programmed to do that. We've got to start looking at the real person, the inside. You see, God teaches that lesson in Samuel. In Samuel, Samuel came to anoint the king. He didn't know it was going to be David. And here he saw someone who was tall, handsome, muscly, great athlete, obviously the football star. Well, you know, modern vernacular. It was one of David's brothers. And what did God say? But the Lord said unto Samuel, Do not look on his countenance or his height or his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. People, our problem is we look on the outward appearance. And my challenge to us is the next time somebody comes into your business, your church, or wherever you are, and they have some differences on the outside, we have got to deprogram ourselves and stop looking at the outside. The minor genetic differences because of the incredible information that God put into the humankind. And we've got to look at the inside. Someone comes in who's got lighter skin than you or darker skin than you, we need to be look, looking at them and saying, is there anything I can do for you? On the inside, do they need the Lord? Do they need our help? Do they need the gospel? Do they need food? What can I do for them? And then, you're driving down, I could, I could show you a street in Cincinnati where you could drive down and you'll see a drug deal on the street. Might not be the right place to stop, go witness to them. You may not have a car when you go back. You won't even have wheels by the end of the street. But you, you know what happens to me? I look at them and I say, Lord, they're probably going to a Christless eternity. What can, what can I do for them? Maybe there's an inner city mission that I can support or go volunteer with or help or support financially to help reach them. And then I like to apply it to, to young men and women. There's a young lady who's a Christian. She sees a guy. Oh, he's tall. He's handsome, strong, the football star. I'd love to go out with him. Young lady, you're a Christian. Does he love the Lord with all his heart and all his soul and all his mind? Because it's not the outside that matters. It's the inside that matters. Or we have a Christian guy. He looks at a girl and says, oh, she's so attractive, so intelligent has just the right amount of melanin I like. Wow, I'd like to go out with her. Young man, does she love the Lord with all her heart and all her soul and all her mind? Because it's the inside that matters. You know, sometimes my wife is with me. She's actually with me uh, today, but this is a men's dinner, so she's not here. 
She went out with some of the ladies. She, she'll be sitting down the front there and I'll say, take my wife. I remember when she was 17 and I first met her and she was gorgeous and beautiful. And now, 48 years later, she's more beautiful than ever. See, I know the right thing to say. <laughs> but you know what? If you fall in love with the outside, you can fall out of love. But if you choose to love the inside and make that commitment before the Lord, that's what it's all about. My wife and I just celebrated our 46th uh, wedding anniversary. And I said to her, it doesn't feel like millions of years. But I can honestly say I love her more now than I ever have. Because that's what marriage is all about. Well, you know what? Can you imagine what would happen if this message was taught in our education system? Because you see, as Christians, we have the answer to racism. See, the history that's taught in the secular world about Big Bang, billions of years, man evolving from ape-like creatures, it's just simply not true. It's a fairy story. But the history that God created the whole universe. He created the first man, Adam, world descendants of Adam. That descendants of Adam became so wicked, every thought of their heart was evil continually, that God judged with a global flood. Actually, I read about the people in Noah's day and read the description of them and I think, wow, it reminds me of what's happening in our Western world today. But you know what? When you think of Sodom and Gomorrah, if there were 10 righteous, and there weren't even 10, and then Abraham doesn't go lower than 10. I've often wondered why. Maybe it's because he knew only eight, eight people survived the flood. Even for eight people, God judged the world. But there are millions of Christians in this nation. And you know what? If we stood up and were courageous, we can be a force out there Amen. in a mighty way. So Dr. Sexton's here doing at this college to raise up people to be a force for the Lord. Think about some of the great Christians of the past. There was only one Moody. There was only one Spurgeon. There was only one Wesley. One Whitfield. Oh, they had differences, but they impacted millions of people. We can do that. And I pray that at this college, there, that there will be Whitfields and Spurgeons and others raised up to be an impact for the Lord. If we stand on God's word boldly, courageously. You know, one of the reasons uh, that many people are not game to do that, to be honest, it's because we're not equipped. And I did want to end just by saying to you, look, one of the most important parts of our ministry, and I know that Dr. Sexton loves, is the fact that we equip people and we want to provide you with information. And we have a, a number of books. Five of our most popular books, actually, are the four Answers books in the Flood of Evidence. We call Answers book number five. Together, 160 of the most asked questions people are going to throw at you today with answers. You get equipped. You study those. You will be equipped with answers. And you know, I want to do this because I realize you, you, you've all given all your money to the college tonight. And so I want to do a special for you, okay? And it's this. Now, I want to do this to encourage you because I don't often speak to 2,500 men in a dinner like this. In fact, the only place I've ever done that is here. This is an incredible, incredible opportunity. This is a, a, a fairly new book that I and my son-in-law, Bodhi, who works at Answers in Genesis, wrote. And it's the most asked questions about Noah's flood and Noah's ark and the animals getting on the ark some of the things I talked about tonight. And it's normally $16, but you tonight can have, this is the only time we're offering this, just tonight. I arranged with our publisher to do this. He, saw, he gives it to us at, at, at below his cost, actually, to do this. So you can have that for $5 tonight. And then I encourage you to get the other four answers books. And then my book, The Lie, really is the importance of the book of Genesis. Did you know all our doctrines are founded in Genesis? You know, the, the whole issue of transgender and gay marriage that's, that's in our culture today, 
what's the answer? The answer is to quote the Son of God in Matthew 19, have you not read he which made the beginning made the male and female and said, for this cause shall a man of his father and mother and cleave unto his wife one male, one female, one man, one woman and be one flesh. It's God who ordained marriage. God created marriage. He created man, male and female. Do you realize all of our doctrines are founded in Genesis 1 to 11? Every single one of them. And if we don't understand Genesis, we can't understand the Christian message. That's why Book the Lie is all about, the book Gospel Reset. How do you evangelize a culture like today's culture that's a pagan culture? You know, we've got a problem today. When you go out there today and say what we used to say generations ago, the Bible says we have generations of kids now. Only 18% of millennials go to church. 18%, that's all. The older generations, over 40% went to church in America. Generation Z is less. And when you say the Bible says, they say, but science has disproved the Bible. We know the Bible's not true. That's why you need those answers to help them understand the Bible is true. And then uh, there's a book, One Race, One Blood. And this one is a brand new one of mine. It was done for kids, but it's good for adults, for families, One Blood for Kids. And it goes through all of what I did tonight uh, at a level that everyone can understand. And I have uh, in here the whole uh, section on skin color and so on. It's all there. And actually, we also produced, and we got those tonight, a track that summarizes the book that you can give away to people. And it's like one of those paint, um, whatever they call them, swatches, whatever, where you can unfold them all. Uh, it's based on that. And it's a swivel track summarizing this whole talk that I did tonight. My son-in-law, Bodhi, did a book on the Tower of Babel showing, you know there are names and cultures all around the world that go back to Noah's grandsons? And it's obvious. Did you know the information is all, you know the evidence is all there, that the Bible's history is true? We have some other books out there, quick answers for tough questions. This one deals with natural selection, Darwinian evolution, adaptation, speciation. If you want genetics at a more technical level, that's what that one is. I'd love to see every college student, every high school student read it. It's a much more in-depth book. But I'm talking on this first thing in the morning at Sunday school, six days, the authority of, of, of the word of God. We're dealing with that issue. The age of the earth and the authority of the word of God. There are books on dinosaurs, there are kids' books. A is for Adam, for instance, Ryan books for kids. A book presenting the gospel to young kids. It's one of their favorites, My Creation Bible. We have answers books for kids. The same questions in the older books, books for older people, uh, kids ask. And so this gives them the answers. And then uh, the Foundations Curriculum Kid, it's our introductory apologetic series. Thousands of churches have used it, thousands of homes. And it's six of my main talks done up as 12, 30-minute programs with study guides to go with them. And it includes the one blood, uh, one race. And just for inf information, our BBS for this year is incredibly popular. The people are signing up for churches left, right, and center. We're in the top three BBS programs sold in the world. And the one this year nobody's ever done before, the incredible race, one family, one race, one savior. We're going to teach kids all these things at BBS. Um, and the one last thing is our Answers magazine. Uh, it is a family magazine, comes out every two months. It's in a creation apologetics magazine. And if you subscribe to the print edition, we will give you the digital edition totally free so that you can have that in your homes on as many devices uh, as you want. And so uh, as I finish tonight and hand back uh, to Dr. Sexton, uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you. People, we have the answers for this culture. This culture is collapsing before our very eyes because we've had generations raised up to believe the Bible's not true. We have the foundation to go out there and give the truth to this culture and to help them understand who they are, where they came from, what their problem is, and most of all, what the solution is in Jesus Christ. Let's get equipped and get out there and do that.